Hi, this is Matt Baker. Today is the last Friday of 2022. So for the third year in a row, I'm going to do a video showing the best fan-made charts of the year. We've got a great chart making community over on Reddit, which is where you can find all of the charts that I'll be showing in this video. There's also a special playlist on the channel where I've put all of the videos about fan made charts, as well as a few tutorials so that you can learn how to make charts too. This video is going to have three parts. First, because of the passing of Queen Elizabeth this year, we got a lot of interesting charts about her. So I'm going to start by looking at those. Second, I chose several charts that I personally wanted to show for one reason or another. So I'll be showing you my picks and telling you what I liked about them. Third, and finally, I'll be doing a top 10 countdown based on the charts that received the most upvotes on the subreddit this year. So let's get to it. Before I begin, I want to thank all of you who supported me on Patreon this year, especially those at the Count Countess or Duke Duchess level. I really do appreciate all the love and support, so thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with some charts relating to Queen Elizabeth and her son Charles III, starting with this one on the House of Vettin, which is the paternal line house that the Queen belonged to. First of all, I have to point out the fancy title in the top left-hand corner. This is one of the most creative ways to present a title that I've ever seen. I absolutely love it. Let's now move down to the bottom and find Queen Elizabeth. There she is, and there is her father, George VI. Now, remember, this is a chart of her paternal line. So everyone on here is an agnatic relative of her father. Agnatic meaning belonging strictly to the same male-only line. So although Elizabeth's house is called Windsor, it is actually just a branch of a much larger house known as the House of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, which includes the last four kings of Portugal, the three czars of modern Bulgaria, and all the kings of Belgium, including the current king, Philippe. Likewise, the House of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha is just a branch of a much larger family, which includes two kings of Poland and every king of the Kingdom of Saxony in Germany, which existed from 1806 to 1918. Basically, everyone I've mentioned so far is a descendant of this guy here, Friedrich I, the first Vettin elector of Saxony, who in turn was a descendant of the various Margraves of Meissen who can be traced all the way back to a man named Theodoric I of Vettin, who lived well over 1,000 years ago. Someone else made a chart about the queen's maternal ancestors. So here we have the queen's mother, whose surname was Bose Lyon. Her father was the 14th and 1st Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn. The reason why he has two numbers is that the earldom of Strathmore and Kinghorn was originally a Scottish title only. But then when his daughter became queen consort, it was included as a peerage in the United Kingdom as well. So you can see that this line goes all the way back to Patrick Lyon in the 1600s. Now, I should point out that the Lyon family was of Anglo-Norman descent. So although people sometimes say that Queen Elizabeth was half Scottish through her mother, this isn't really true. Although that family had a Scottish title, they weren't technically Scottish. In fact, if we look at the Queen Mother's mother, Cecilia Cavendish Bentwick, we'll find that she belonged to an English noble family associated with the Dukedom of Portland. In fact, Cecilia was the great-granddaughter of William Cavendish Bentwick, who was the third Duke of Portland, as well as the Prime Minister of the UK from 1807 to 1809. Now, whereas the Queen belonged to the House of Vettin, Charles, through his father, belongs to the House of Mountbatten, which is what this chart focuses on. However, please note that the House of Mountbatten is not actually the agnatic house of King Charles. Technically, Charles III belongs to the House of Glücksburg, which is the house of his father's father. The House of Mountbatten is actually the house of his father's mother. 
She was British, whereas Prince Philip's father was Greek and Danish, which is why when Prince Philip married Queen Elizabeth, he shifted his membership from the Foreign House of Glücksburg to the British House of Mountbatten. But the House of Mountbatten only goes back as far as Prince Philip's maternal grandfather, Louis. He was originally a German prince, but after marrying one of the granddaughters of Queen Victoria, he became a British citizen. In fact, serving as the Admiral of the Fleet for the British Royal Navy during World War I. But you can see here that Mount Batten is simply the English version of the German Battenberg. Berg meaning mountain. And in fact, the Battenbergs are simply a branch of the German House of Hesse. The reason why they lost the privilege of using the name was because of this marriage, which was deemed morganatic. Here's something a little bit different. This timeline shows all the various things that Queen Elizabeth lived through. So she was born in the Roaring Twenties, and then as a young girl and teen, she lived through the Great Depression, as well as World War II. But then as queen, she went on to live through many decades of world events, from the construction of the Berlin Wall to its fall, and from the early days of space exploration to the current COVID-19 pandemic. So yeah, she lived to see a lot. And of course, as the most high-profile monarch in the world, she had a front row seat through much of it. Here's another chart that captures the incredible length of her reign. This one shows all the various countries that she was queen of. At the beginning, she was actually only queen of the UK and six other dominions, since all the other countries were, at that point, still colonies or protectorates. But you can see how, as many countries achieved independence, she became queen of more and more places. Although in some cases, like in Pakistan and South Africa, she ceased to be queen, as those countries opted to become republics. The most recent country she became queen of was St. Kitts and Nevis in 1983. And the most recent country she ceased to be queen of was Barbados in 2021. Now here's something that I actually posted on the subreddit. It's not really a chart, but rather a photo from the queen's funeral, where you can see a very rare thing occurring. Eight reigning monarchs from Europe, as well as two former monarchs, all standing together at the same time in the same place. And here's something a bit more lighthearted. This is a family tree of the queen's corgis. They can all be traced back to a dog named Susan that the queen received when she was 18. The green square is a Dachshund named Pipkin, who belonged to the queen's sister, Princess Margaret. That dog mated with one of the queen's corgis to produce two dorgies, which are a cross between a Dachshund and a corgi. The other dorgies owned by the queen over the years are marked in purple as well, with all the blue squares being all of the purebred corgis. This next chart shows some of the relatives of Camilla, the new queen consort. She was previously married to Andrew Parker Bowles, with whom she has two children, who are thus the step-siblings of William and Harry. Interestingly, Camilla's great-grandmother, Alice Edmonstone, was one of King Edward VII's lovers. Little did she know that one of her descendants would go on to be a lover of yet another king, but this time that lover would end up becoming queen. Okay, so those were the charts I wanted to show you related to the passing of Queen Elizabeth. Let's now move on to some of my own personal favorites. I want to start with one that's an extension of one of my own charts. I made something like this several years ago for my Who Has the Best Claim to the Title of Roman Emperor video. My version had only five possibilities at the bottom, whereas this one has 14. Most notably, this one adds a line for the Bulgarian Empire, about 100 years before Charlemagne, based on the fact that Turval of Bulgaria received the title of Caesar from Justinian II. Around the same time, it also adds a line for the Papal States, noting that it was at this point that the Duchy of Rome was handed over to the direct control of the popes, which means that a good argument can be made that the current pope is actually the direct successor of the Roman emperors. Also on the chart, however, are the Savoys, who can also be seen as contenders, as can the Hohenzollerns, and pretty much every other royal house in Europe. I also wanted to make sure I gave a shout out to this person, 
who made a line of succession chart modeled on my UK one, but for every other monarchy in Europe. This one, for example, shows the 11 people in the line of succession to the throne of Sweden. However, on the subreddit, you can find ones for the Netherlands, Belgium, Norway, etc. I also quite liked this chart, which combines characters from the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions. The three colors, blue, red, and green, represent which tradition gives us the genealogical information. So, for example, while Jonah appears first in Jewish literature, it is actually from a Muslim source that he is said to be from the tribe of Benjamin. In addition to this, the three symbols provide information on how each person is venerated in each tradition. So, if there's a Star of David, that person is a prophet in Judaism. If there's a cross, that person is a saint in Catholicism. And if there's a crescent moon, that person is a prophet in Islam. So, note that Lot is considered a prophet in Islam, but not in Judaism. Likewise, Sarah is a prophet or prophetess in Judaism, but not in Islam. I also really liked this chart because it's a topic that I thought about doing on my channel, but never got around to it. It's about the seven legendary kings of Rome who were said to have ruled before the Roman Republic. So here we have the twin brothers Romulus and Remus, who were supposedly the children of the god Mars, but who also supposedly descended from Aeneas, the Trojan prince who founded a city near Rome, and who was in turn the son of the goddess Venus. The next three kings all have remote connections to the first king Romulus, but are not actually his descendants. And then the last three are altogether unconnected. They include Tarkin the Elder, his son-in-law Servius Tullius, and then Tarkin the Elder's son, Tarkin the Proud. And now for something completely different. This is a simple chart, but a very informative one. If you know anything about royal genealogy, you'll know that there is always a certain level of inbreeding involved. This chart shows two of the worst cases. If you go back seven generations, a normal person should have 128 great-great-great-great-grandparents. However, a person who married their full sibling will have only 64. Well, Charles II from the House of Habsburg had only 32. And Cleopatra of Egypt, well, she only had a mere 20. So, yeah, gross. Okay, my remaining choices were picked for style, not necessarily content. This next one I picked because it demonstrates that sometimes simple is best. This chart slash map shows the birthplaces of the various royal consorts of France. So obviously there were a lot of French-born French queen consorts. But beyond those, it seems like most kings of France liked to marry Spanish, Italian, or Austrian princesses. Probably had to do with the fact that those countries were primarily Catholic. Here's one from my good friend Oscar, host of the YouTube channel House of History. I wanted to show this one because I think it's a good example of someone developing his or her own unique style. Although I really like the fact that many of you have been able to reproduce the useful chart style almost perfectly, I also like it when people develop their own styles as well, which is what Oscar did here. Another good example is this one, which is actually quite close to the standard useful chart style, but also just different enough that it stands out as being unique. There are more rounded lines, and each box slash image has a rectangle around it in a color that's slightly darker than the box itself, which makes for a nice effect. This next one is kind of the opposite. This creator has developed a style that is 100% unique, which is cool because whenever I see a chart with this particular style, I instantly know who made it. Plus, I really like this style with its use of circular portraits, text that is not in a box, and a font that looks like calligraphy. Altogether, it makes for a style that I find to be particularly pleasing to the eye. My final pick is this one here. You know, I really like how the Useful Charts community has been able to attract people of all ages. I think most fans tend to be in their late teens to early 30s, but I know we have several younger kids as well as a few old timers. This image was posted by a parent and was obviously done by someone on the younger side. 
but I find it amazing how you can still quite clearly see that the useful chart style is being used. So I hope this kid sticks around and continues to post his work as he gets older. Okay, it's now time for the top 10, but a few things to note first. I basically just clicked top and then this year, but I excluded the following. I did not include any memes or posts that were primarily meant for humor only. I also didn't include any charts that I've already featured in previous videos, such as the ones that won the Reddit contest and a few that were actually repeats from previous years. Also, I only allowed one chart per person. So if a single user had several top charts, I chose their best one only. And finally, I didn't include charts based on fictional worlds. So everything you're about to see is real world history. So coming in at number 10 was this chart on how Prince Philip is connected to the Romanovs. In the early 90s, some remains were found in Russia that were thought to belong to the Romanov children who were executed alongside their parents in 1918. In order to test whether or not the remains were in fact the Romanov children, scientists used DNA submitted by Prince Philip. Now, Prince Philip and the last czar, Nicholas II, do come from the same patrilineal line. And in fact, Prince Philip is even more closely related to Nicholas II through his maternal grandmother, who was a Russian Grand Duchess. However, that's not why they used his DNA. They used it because, unlike Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip is actually a descendant of Queen Victoria via a strict female-only line. And so were the Romanov children. This means that they all share the exact same mitochondrial DNA. Of course, on this channel, that particular female-only line has a name, the House of Garcenda. This next chart is kind of related. It shows all of Queen Victoria's children and grandchildren. So there's Empress Alexandra of Russia again, as well as Princess Victoria, grandmother to Prince Philip. One of the most notable things about Queen Victoria's family tree is that many of her descendants suffered from the disease hemophilia, which can be passed through females, but only affects males. So Alice's son Friedrich had it, dying at age three, but it was also passed to Irene and Alexandra. Alexandra passed it to her son Alexei, who was the heir apparent to the Russian throne, but was assassinated with the rest of his family in 1918. The disease also passed through Beatrice, with her sons Leopold and Morris having it, and Victoria Eugenie, who became the Queen Consort of Spain, passing it on to her firstborn son, Alfonso. Next up is yet another chart focused on inbreeding within the royal family. This one focuses on Ferdinand I, who was the first emperor of Austria, but also the last Holy Roman Emperor as Ferdinand V. The average person has two parents, four grandparents, and eight great-grandparents. But Ferdinand only had four great-grandparents because his two grandfathers were actually the brothers of his two grandmothers. Okay, we now move from a small chart to a large one. This one is about the UK monarchs and the earlier Scottish and English ones as well. What I like about this chart is that it includes explanations and maps throughout. So, for example, here at the top, there's a note about the end of Roman rule in Britain, and then some information about the Dane law and the great heathen army. I also like the use of the many coats of arms throughout, especially how the seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms are represented here at the top as then being united by the House of Wessex, which then starts off the tree that eventually leads to all the various kings of England. Of course, there's lots about Scotland as well, including a note about tanistry, which is a special type of succession that was used there. All right, next up is something a bit unusual. The title of this post was How I'm My Own Cousin. So this guy was adopted by his biological father's aunt and uncle, who became his adopted parents. So in other words, his biological grandfather and his adopted mother are siblings. This means that his biological grandpa is also his uncle and that his bio dad is also his first cousin. And because he's his bio dad's son, he's also his very own first cousin once removed. 
reminds me of a certain song I made a video about for April Fool's Day this year. And it just goes to show that making family tree charts can be a lot of fun. Okay, we now have a chart of Oceanan and American royal family trees. This chart is by the same person who made the African royal family trees chart, which was the runner up in this year's Reddit contest and which we now sell on our website. So basically the only part of the world that we don't currently sell a royal family tree poster about is Oceania and the Americas, which is what this chart is about. So on here are the Aztecs and Incas, as well as the empires of Brazil and Mexico. There's also the monarchs of Hawaii and the only current monarchy in Oceania, which is that of Tonga. Although when I say only monarchy in Oceania, keep in mind that I'm not counting the various countries such as Australia that are a part of the British Commonwealth. And gotta love that he also included as a bonus, the three greatest Antarctic dynasties. All right, we now come to this chart on Southern Italy, which as I explained in a recent video, had a rather complicated history with lots of different kingdoms, duchies and principalities. So at the beginning, you can see that there were lots of different dynasties fighting for power, but then these were mostly consolidated following the Norman conquest and the conquest of Charles I of Anjou. From there, things were consolidated even further under the Spanish, until eventually you get the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which was then combined with the Kingdom of Sardinia to form Italy. So this now brings us to the top three. Coming in at number three is this chart covering Genghis Khan and his many, many descendants. Of course, it only shows the important ones because as you probably know, most people in Asia are probably related to Genghis Khan one way or another. So in blue, we have the original dynasty and then the branch of his family that ruled his greatest conquest, China. And although the Yuan dynasty there was eventually replaced by the Ming dynasty, it did actually continue in Mongolia where it was known as the Northern Yuan. So it goes all the way down to 1635. But of course, there's also the descendants of his firstborn son, Jochi, shown in yellow, the descendants of Chagatai, shown in maroon, and the descendants of Hulagu, who ruled in Persia, shown in green. The black section in the middle is the dynasty of Timur, who wasn't actually a descendant of Genghis Khan, but rather a distant cousin. That dynasty is directly connected to the Mughals of India, shown in dark green near the bottom. Coming in at number two is something that I didn't expect to see. This chart shows how the popular YouTuber Mark Fishbach, better known as Markiplier, is actually quite closely related to the president, Zachary Taylor. Basically, he's a direct descendant of Taylor's sister, Constance. So although the Fischbachs are of more recent German descent, Mark has some deep US ancestry through his maternal grandmother, Flora, whose maiden name was Doom. So that's kind of interesting. I hope the genie vlogger sees this because he has a special interest in tracing the family trees of YouTubers. Okay, we are now at number one. This was the most liked chart of the year and you can see why. It's huge and must have taken a lot of time. This chart has actually evolved over the course of the year and what you see here is the most recent version. It's a chart of the original Roman emperors, but then it goes on to include the various states that claimed to be the direct successors of the Roman Empire as well. So it's got the Byzantine emperors, of course, as well as the Holy Roman emperors, some of the early Ottomans, and even the Russian czars, who you probably know, claimed to be the rulers of the third Rome. What I really like about this chart is all of the maps that show the evolution of Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay, so that was a look at some of the best fan-made charts of 2022. I apologize that 
I couldn't show everybody's chart, but I do encourage everyone to go over to the Useful Charts subreddit and check out all the great content that's being posted there on a daily basis. And two quick announcements before I go. First, I've decided to combine next year's Reddit contest with next year's year end review. So this time, there's no need to label your contest submission in any special way. I'll be waiting until December 2023 and then considering all of the posts that were submitted throughout the year. One factor will be the number of upvotes received, but in the end, the final decision will be made by the Useful Charts team. We'll announce the winner in the year-end video, and like last time, the winner will have their chart printed and sold by Useful Charts. And the second announcement concerns my good friend Xiaowish, who hosts the YouTube channel Al Mukadama. As you might know, Xiaowish has been the main animator for the Useful Charts channel for a couple of years now. Originally from Pakistan, he's been living in Germany for the last few years, finishing his master's degree. But this February, he'll be moving to Canada, where he'll be officially joining the Useful Charts team as a full-time employee. So you can expect to continue to see amazing, high-quality animation on the channel in the year to come. All right, that's it for me for 2022. See you in 2023. Thanks for watching.